Mm. I'm fucked. Thought you did, gang. What's going on with you, gang? Today we got that final affliction. A hooker diver was swallowed whole by a great white shark. That nigga got, uh, got munched up. <laughs> like, what the fuck is you doing? Hookah diving in a place that ain't your natural habitat. <laughs> we don't belong that deep in the water. Okay, what nobody say. We do not belong that deep in water. At all. Fuck what you talking about. You gotta be. I'm not even gonna go there. Eight seconds, sir. A Japanese who could diver. See, y'all, you gotta be fucked up. Is bitten on the head by a man eating great white shark. It had already eaten a diver just a few days earlier and was back for more. Hit that like button Damn. and subscribe right now. This is the terrifying shark attack on... That nigga was spinning blocks. Spinning shark blocks. He was spinning shark blocks. Nigga on the dead fans. Azuta Harada, welcome to Final Affliction. <laughs> the ancient Ama divers of Japan have a history that stretches back 3,000 years. Back in the day, it was reserved for women only. But in the last... They said the women are dying first. Nah, that shit crazy. But what the fuck? Why the fuck was she jumping in the water like that? I don't condone that. The ancient Ama divers of Japan have a history that stretches back 3,000 years. Back in the day, it was reserved for women only. But in the last 100 years, a few men have entered into this profession too. They die for pearls, shellfish, and mussels. Even back then, the profession was one that was highly prized by the royals, and their tables were almost solely supplied by the ama, if seafood was on the menu. The dedication, fitness, and skill that needed to be applied was of such a high standard that only the best of the best made it in the industry. It's said that the Ama divers had the longest lifespans in all of Japan. And that's what? saying something coming from the country that boasts some of the highest life expectancy ages in the world. It's not uncommon to see 70-year-old Ama divers who are every bit as active in the industry as their younger competitors. The divers traditionally wear white when they're in the water. This choice of clothing is made for very practical reasons. It deters sharks. When the predators are looking up from below, the white cloth is almost indistinguishable from the daylight sky above the water. That's also why most sea mammals have white bellies. It's the best camouflage that nature can provide. Besides their white oh, tunics and loincloths. That, they never taught us up at school. Right there. They ain't never taught me that up at school. I think I'm gonna start wearing white then when I 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 when I'm, when I'm, when I'm near oceans. <laughs> what? I'm gonna start wearing white when I'm near oceans. What? I get I, I fuck around with up in the ocean. I'm gonna be safe. Cause I got white on. <laughs> the ama divers wear nothing else. As recently as the 80s, most ama dove bare chested. And keep in mind, most ama are women. There's a reason that they're called the mermaid divers. No scuba gear and no oxygen tanks. These are the original free divers. They're hard. They're hard. The originals are hard. The original ones are hard. No, no, no air tanks, no nothing. Like, they're hard. Just straight white cloth. Ugh. Bare chest. Ugh. Masters of their craft. Like his predecessors, Kazuta Harada could stay underwater for twice the length of time than the average human could. He and his two colleagues specialized in shell diving, especially the highly prized abalone that fetched the highest price at the docks. Even the American and European restaurants and the elite members of society sent their vessels over to Japan to get their hands on the rare delicacy. 
Kazuda and his two companions were some of the very few men who became Ama. But then again, their mothers were all Ama divers too. Oh. They were raised on the water, and it was only natural that they would follow in their parents' footsteps. Kazuta and his two companions, Akira and Ken, had their own fishing vessel equipped with modern radios and engines. They were some of the first Ama divers to take a more modern approach to the occupation. Make no mistake, the skills needed to go down 30 feet with only the air that your lungs can hold were still every bit as old school as their ancestors honed. But the large, domed, diving helmets and neoprene suits definitely made the icy water more bearable. Das Maxton Hall College ist nicht einfach eine Schule. Es ist eine And it allowed them to see more living treasures hidden amongst the crevices. The neoprene suits aren't the skin-tight diving suits we use today. They're much more loose-fitting and light, allowing for more mobility and weight. The fabric that soaks up the water, coupled with the weighted stones tied to their belts, helped the Ama reach the bottom much faster and more smoothly. All three men were on edge. The last two weeks had news of shark sightings and even one fatality in the area. Every time a fish was spotted breaking the water, the radios would spread the news and location between the boats. None of the vessels were equipped with radar or the high-tech whistles and cogs we have today, so they relied on word of mouth to keep everyone in the loop. Word had spread that the Great White that caused the fatality of another Ama diver was at least 16 feet long, and the sightings after the attack was almost certainly the same shark. The morning was cold and overcast. He was on the hunt. Not that the temperature. That shark was on the hunt. He was bloodthirsty. He got some blood in him. Some human blood. Oh, it, it's in the area? What? Man, I'm pushing lines. Every time. The men all that much. They'd trained in freezing waters all of their lives, after all. Ken kept the radio within earshot as he fed the ropes tied to Kazuda and Akira down below. Every few minutes, one of the men would resurface with a bag full of crustaceans and shellfish. Ken then loaded the haul into their coolers before handing the empty bag back so that it could be filled all over again. So far, the morning had gone well. Their coolers were filling up nicely, and they would probably be able to go home earlier than usual, if they got half a dozen more good dives in. Akira exited the water and took over from Ken, while Ken got ready to enter the water to take the last shift. Kazuda wasn't quite done yet. At 41, he was the oldest in the group, but he was by far the most experienced, and he had the most stamina. He dumped his latest catch and took another breath, sinking down into the depths once again. From behind his fishbowl helmet, Kazuda could see the rocky bottom, covered in seaweed, and even from up high he could already spot the next clump of abalone suctioned on the side of a boulder. Their pearly blue shells sparkled merrily in the dim light from above. Kazuda's lungs were full, so he took his time pulling them off their anchored homes. But behind him, a predator had been lurking for the past hour. The very great white that had killed a female Amadiver just a week before, like it did with her. It observed the men first, staying just far enough so that they couldn't see it. It knew that it had exactly two minutes before the man resurfaced again. If it were going to strike, it needed to do it now, while he was alone. Kazuta's back was turned toward the deadly missile that torpedoed at him through the water. With his mind, hands, and eyes busy trying to pry the stubborn shells off the rock face, there was no way that he could have braced himself for the impact that was about to hit him. He was slammed into the rock in front of him so hard that he didn't even feel the teeth piercing his suit. His face struck the rock, cracking his screen and flooding the suit with water. The animal reared back, tearing the fabric and Kazuda's back to shreds as it went. Kazuda screamed into the salt water, the bubbles from his mouth rising silently to the surface. The shark began to swim toward the deep with Kazuda held in its jaws, but the rope around Kazuda snapped tight, almost pulling it out of Akira's hands. The sudden resistance was enough to tear Kazuda free. Akira acted quickly when he felt the sudden jerk. He knew that Kazuda was being attacked by something down below. He didn't wait long enough to see the explosion of red bubbles breach the surface. He just dug his feet into the hull of the boat, pulling with all his might and screaming for Ken to help him. 
Together, they pulled their friend in. Kazuta surfaced, miraculously still alive and conscious, though he was leaving a trail of blood that turned the water red behind him as he was pulled toward the vessel. But their moment of relief was short-lived. Just as Ken reached out to grab Kazuta's already outstretched hand, the beast was back. Like some bizarre scene from Jaws, it sailed out from the deep and snatched Kazuta right in front of their eyes, burying him back down into its aquatic playground. The men gripped the rope and started pulling again, but with one strong shake, the shark ripped Kazuta right out of his already shredded suit. The sudden lack of resistance sent Ken and Akira plowing backwards so far that they nearly landed in the sea themselves. Hoping that the animal just lost its grip, they reeled the rope. Oh my god, they said like an attack off of Jaws or something. Been as fast as they could, but there was no weight to it at all. They knew before the remains of Kazuta's ripped suit surfaced that Kazuta wouldn't be inside it anymore. That tattered suit was all that they had to bring back to Kazuta's family. They never found his remains, but that didn't stop the shark from coming back. After two successful kills, it was now actively searching the shoreline for more Ama. But the Ama's willingness to embrace the new ways meant that the message was spread far and wide across the radio channels. Every single diver evacuated the water for two whole weeks, leaving the animal to search in vain until it finally became so hungry that it retreated back into the deep ocean to find food elsewhere. These two weeks weren't just effective at getting rid of the hunter, it also allowed the Ama divers across Japan's shores from the north to the south to pay their respects to their fallen comrade, Kazuda's mother, who was still an active diver at the age of 71, and his sister, also a diver herself, received the remains of his suit and used it instead of his body to complete the appropriate funeral rites as best they could. It wasn't perfect, but it was all they had to bury. The only thing left of Kazuta Harada is the horrifying story of his terrifying final affliction. That's hella sad. I feel bad for that family. Damn. Damn. <clears throat> um, if y'all made it this far, like, comment, share, and that sub button. Shoot. Do y'all be out there doing that type of stuff? Me personally, no. I don't like large bodies of water. Never will catch me doing that type of shit ever, 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 ever. Um, sorry. Oh, damn. But yeah. Comment y'all water, water story. Ooh, shit, that shit hurt. That shit hurt. But yeah, let me get it with y'all in the next video, game. That's wild.